Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the J.G. Hagee Hall of the Humanities at the University of Waterloo. My name is Sandra Banks, and I am honored to serve here as, uh, at the university as Vice President, University Relations. We are so very pleased to be hosting this event this evening and bringing together all of you as community leaders, citizens, colleagues, and friends for this very special event and celebration with the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson. Let me first acknowledge that we have several elected officials who have joined us this evening as well, and um, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome them. We have um, Regional Chair Ken Sealing, Mayor Dave Jaworski, Mayor Sandy Sh uh, Shantz, Mayor Sue Foxton, Members of Parliament H Harold Albrecht, Raj Saini, and Marwan Tabara, as well as two members of Provincial Parliament, Catherine McGarry, and Diane Verniel. Welcome, everyone. And on behalf of the University of Waterloo, I can say that we are very delighted to be working with our partners this evening, John Newfeld and Rosemary Smith from the House of Friendship and the Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation. We've been working at the university with these two organizations, not just in bringing this event to you this evening, but on a number of other initiatives throughout the year. Together, we can and we have accomplished so very much. For example, each year, members of our faculty, staff, and students take part in the House of Friendship uh, Christmas Hamper Program. Earlier this year, over 100 Waterloo students ventured out into the community to help bag groceries, serve hot chocolate on a cold day, as well as deliver over 6,500 acts of kindness. This day was inspired by the efforts of Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation and their random acts of kindness day that they sponsor in the Waterloo region. We're very proud of examples like this, particularly with our students who can support the community in meaningful ways and at the same time as advancing their uh, academic experience, foster their own sense of belonging in this community. And we know that's the reason that we've assembled here tonight. Uh, and we are going to continue that conversation and that dialogue. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rosemary Smith, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation. Please help me in welcoming Rosemary to the stage as she prepares to introduce our special guest speaker this evening. Thank you. I'm just full of excitement tonight. Thanks, Sandra, for welcoming us to this wonderful this space and this wonderful opportunity. Before I begin, I'm going to get adjusted. <laughs> I'd like to uh, ask you to take a look to your left, my right, and introduce to you Carolyn Ellis. You might want to pay attention to what Carolyn's going to be doing this evening. She will be setting the stage and capturing the themes and the essence of the evening as it unfolds. So you've got a whole chronolog chronological opportunity going to unfold in front of you. We've been asked many, many times, why are you spending so much time talking about belonging? Why on earth should we focus on this when we have so many hungry, homeless, and challenged individuals? In response, we might say, or we might ask in return, how can we possibly improve the quality of life for individuals when we do not address the underlying causes that led them to being marginalized in the first place? In other words, you can't just supply food, housing, and give them those needs without truly taking a look at the underlying values, the assets that they bring, and the contributions they can give to our community. We understand and acknowledge the, is the issues such as poverty, housing, and food security. They're very real challenges. As a matter of fact, we see them every day. But how do we tackle complex issues if those of us who have the resources don't feel like we matter and that we can make a difference collectively for our community. 
Waterloo Region's vital signs data is telling us that in our community, only 31% of us feel like we have a strong sense of belonging. Here tonight, almost 10% of those of you who are here have noted that you have a weak sense of belonging to your community. We've seen an 11% decrease in volunteerism in the last five years and a 22% drop in the number of people who donate since 1997. People are volunteering, giving, and voting less. And those with a lower sense of belonging are less likely to participate in community events, are less satisfied with their neighborhood, and less satisfied with their local government. Belonging is not an issue that we can solve overnight. We acknowledge that. But as a community, we need to commit to making change happen. One of the ways we can do that is by doing exactly what each and every one of you is doing tonight, coming together to listen and to learn and to talk about what is it we need to do. And how do we inspire in each of us the responsibility to build the kind of community where we want to live, we want to work, we want to play, and we want to raise our families? I'm proud to say the three organizations came together. The House of Friendship with a great idea, the University of Waterloo with great resources and opportunities, and the Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation who sees itself as an enabler to invite the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson to our community tonight. That brings me, if you will, to the last of my job for this evening. The Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson came to Canada from Hong Kong as a refugee in 1942 and made an astonishing journey from a penniless child to an accomplished broadcaster and a distinguished public servant. She is the best-selling author of the 2014 CBC Massey Lectures, Belonging, the Paradox of Citizenship, Room for All of Us, Surprising Stories of Loss, and Transformation, Heart Matters, a memoir, as well as a biography of Dr. Norman Bethune, the Canadian hero of the Chinese people. Along with her husband, John Ralston Saul, Madame Clarkson co-founded the Institute for Canadian Citizenship in 2005. Its venture is to help new citizens in Canada integrate into Canadian life. The ICC is currently creating the inaugural Six Degrees Initiative, a citizen space focused on inclusion and citizenship, which will be held in Toronto in September of this year. Madame Clarkson has been quoted as saying, each of us is carving a stone, erecting a column, or cutting a, a piece of stained glass in the construction of something much bigger than ourselves. I'm honored to invite to the stage the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for that wonderful introduction and for stating some of the very important facts in your Kitchener-Waterloo Foundation report, which I found very, very interesting. Friends from this community, one of the startling communities that I visited first when I was 15 years old. Previous to that, I had lived in the Ottawa Valley not a place known for the wealth of its, arch of its uh, uh, agriculture. Um, and coming at the age of 15 and driving from Toronto down to Stratford, which was wonderful for me, and seeing the beautiful farms, the fields, the richness of this agriculture was a whole other Canada to me. And in the same province, 
Ottawa, the Ottawa Valley, although farmed by people, uh, was not like Southern Ontario. And Southern Ontario has its own special kind of feeling to it. I acknowledge that we are here on the territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. And we are here on that land which has been traditionally theirs. But what we have done with that land has been very, very interesting. And what you have done in your community with its predominantly German background, and you all know the history of that. I'm not going to repeat it to you. I repeat it to foreigners because particularly French and German people are fascinated by Kitchener having come from Berlin. They also, I think, are interested in the fact that we have in this area um, a religious minority that was persecuted in Europe and sought refuge in Canada and thrived, developed, changed, moved a kind of community here, the Mennonites. And it never ceases to surprise me how we are able to keep all these pieces together and feel it always as a marvelous kind of place. And I think in this particular space is a wonderful lesson for us all in Canada as each part of Canada has its history, has its particularity. When we talk about belonging, we have to think of what we belong to. And you can't belong unless there is something to belong to. You have to be able to belong, but you have also to be able to criticize, to disagree, and that is fundamental to belonging. Belonging makes you feel safe. Within that safety, you can do all of those things which are the essence of living the true life and living a life which is free and democratic, the kind of life which we all believe that we inherited through the various strains of philosophies that Western civilization brought to us. We also have to, by belonging and by believing in belonging, acknowledge and really feel that all human beings are equal, that everybody is a human being, and there is no human being who is more human than any other. I think that is something we have to really internalize because I think it is something that underlies a lot of the problems that we face today. You have to realize that when we say a human being, we mean the whole human being. The country to the south of us, the United States, which this year is in an electoral battle, has an electoral college which will decide what and who their president will be. And that electoral college was established by their fathers by George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Hancock. Well, you know them. We all know them because of history. And that was a, an electoral college in which human beings were allotted to each state, and each state had a certain number of votes for the final vote for president, according to the number of human beings. And so they had human beings in the United States at the time they founded it. They had black and white human beings. And so they counted one white human being. And a black human being was counted as two-thirds of a white human being. We are very fortunate in this country not to have that past. We are very fortunate not to have it because we don't have to get over it. And it is something which we should regard with enormous sympathy when we look at our neighbors to the south, that that's something that they have to get over. And they haven't yet. And I think we all recognize that. And it's not to make us feel superior. It's not our history. It's their history. But they haven't gotten over it. 
I think my own story is one that has a lot of reverberations for people because in a way I encapsulate in great extreme what many and most people of this country have felt. That is being uprooted, being brought to a place which we didn't choose to be in, and then having to make our way in it and learn new things and new habits. And I think that that's in the DNA of most Canadians. That is only one, two, or three generations back that we know that we came here and there was nowhere else to go and they had to take us in. So this became our home. This became the place where we could be. And because it was the place where we could be, we were able to help make it. We were help, able to help shape it. The way in which people choose to belong is really up to them in a free and de democratic society. And that is what is very interesting about Canada because we've always made it possible for people to choose what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. And it's really been very interesting for me in my lifetime, which stretches back to my arrival at the age of three in 1942, to see what kind of country we were. We were a white, fairly racist country when I arrived here. The Chinese exclusion laws had been enacted in 1923, which basically was to, was to discourage any kind of immigration from China and to keep the yellow peril at bay. It certainly didn't work. <laughs> and when you look at things like that, and of course last year when I was in the midst of writing Belonging, a PhD student from UBC sent me a photocopy of something I had never seen before, which was the register for Chinese head tax in Canada, which went on till the early 1950s, in case you didn't know that. And we were listed there as a family, although nobody had ever informed us that we were there. There I see my name, female, age nine, um, because that was when they got around to registering us. The big benefit of things like that is that bureaucracy is clumsy and slow and doesn't get around to putting people into books. The only time it acts with real savage viciousness is usually in wartime, when all of human, most of human rights are suspended and people's rights are completely overpowered, as is the case with the Japanese Canadians in the 40s. That didn't come out of nowhere. Canada was, parts of Canada were intensely racist. The west coast of Canada had enacted some 70 odd laws in the 30s, the, Brit the province of British Columbia, which the federal government disallowed in the 30s. 70 odd racist laws. So by the time 1942, 43 came along and people were eyeing the Japanese Canadians, many of whom had been in Canada for three generations and said, you know, maybe they're spies. Gee, they have big fishing boats and gosh, they've got some nice property and really good farms. Maybe we should get them off the coast. And they took all that away from them and they profited from it. And they sent the Japanese Canadians to the equivalent of concentration camps in the interior of British Columbia. They couldn't have gotten away with that if public opinion had not thought, okay, that's great, you know, they're little yellow people and they don't have any right to be wearing hats and gloves and playing on baseball teams and going to nice churches. We can take whatever we like. That was the last really savage act of racism that we had in this country. And we must never forget it because there are people still alive who grew up in it. Raymond Moriyama, the great architect who built our wonderful new war museum in Ottawa. He learned that he wanted to be an architect by building a tree house uh, in New Denver where he was incarcerated with his parents and I wrote the introduction to his memoirs. So he said when he was 14 he realized he could construct something and it was, happened to be there. Uh, Bruce Kuwabara's family, um, also, he's, a, he's the, one of our greatest architects, uh, he also realized when his family, he was not born at the time of the war, when his family had to leave the West Coast because they were allowed, where they were not allowed to settle back on the coast uh, within a hundred miles of the coast after the war. They came east to face enormous discrimination. That he also realized that when he was living in Hamilton where people wanted the Japanese Canadians for work at the steel plant, that he wanted to be an architect. So out of all of this turmoil, you get people who still have the feeling 
that they want to commit themselves to this country. They want to be part of it. For me, it was not, it was a really conscious effort. We were very fortunate in that we came from Hong Kong, which nobody knew where that was when we came, because most of the Chinese people who were here had come for the railroads, and most people that were known as Chinamen had restaurants, the Maple Leaf Cafe in Sudbury, or they had laundries. But we were people completely kind of different from that because we were from the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. We spoke English. My parents had English education. We didn't have that. We were also Anglicans, which helped us an enormous amount. I do have to say that the churches have always played a role in this country of helping to settle people and making sure that that generosity and that feeling of hum common humanity was always exemplified. And my parents saw immediately that this was a bilingual country because we ended up in Ottawa, and my father got a job in the oils and fats department of the Department of Trade and Commerce as a clerk, and he saw there were French Canadians, there were English Canadians, and the French Canadians could speak both languages, but the English Canadians couldn't. And he said, you know, I think if you learned French, and you learned English as well, and uh, you have English as well, you'll get really ahead. And he was right. Uh, because I did become the first Governor General of, who's Anglophone, who was fluently bilingual. That is more of an anomaly, in a way, than my having been an immigrant or a refugee, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was a conscious choice my parents made of our belonging to something. It was an amorphous something at that point. People were very against francophones in Ottawa. I used to hear things like speak white to, pe to French Canadians in Lower Town in Ottawa. Um, there was, I worked for, three, for a couple of summers in high school in the warehouse of a department store called A.J. Freeman. Those of you who are from Ottawa might remember it. And I loved the warehouse and everybody was francophone and I used to try to speak some French too then, although I knew I was going to go, my pro father promised me that I would go to Paris after graduating from university if I really did well in my studies. And, um, and I used to go down to Lower Town on the streetcar and I would hear, I would hear that from the, bus con from the streetcar conductors saying, you know, if somebody asked for tickets and they asked in French, that hideous phrase, speak white. Uh, so it gave me an enormous sympathy of the people who were uh, the workers who spoke French basically and also spoke English and who were the underclass and treated as such. And we were, of course, an anomaly because we had also um, this whole feeling of being Anglicans, which was very much a part of our life, and which my, my, my great, great uncle had translated the Book of Common Prayer into Chinese. And my parents were married by the wonderful Bishop of Hong Kong, who later um, was the first Anglican bishop to ordain a woman uh, during the war, Florence or Lim, because uh, there, was, there weren't enough priests to go around and give sacraments, so he ordained her and he was punished for it by the central church, but never mind another question. Um, and, but what I drew from every, all those strange things of my background was that you could belong in Canada and be all of those things, and there would be other people who would be different from you but if you were part of that, you could simply accept them as they accepted you. Years ago in my favorite television program, Take 30, which I'm sure a lot of you watched, um, I interviewed Conrad Lawrence, an expert on aggression. And uh, he was working with geese at the time. And one of the things he said to me that's always stayed with me, and I say it always to anybody, including my own children who worry about the fact, worry, used to worry when their children were little, uh, my grandchildren were babies, about whether they would let their children cry or not. And I said, Conrad Lawrence said to me that we are too concerned with making children happy and that it is shown and proven in the animal kingdom that adversity in childhood is a good thing. He didn't mean by that, you know, the kind of killing adversity or beatings or horriblenesses, but that a little adversity is not a bad thing for people. 
And I've always carried that with me. I guess when adverse things happened to me when I was little and when I was at school or whatever, and setbacks, that I really believe that he was saying true things. And I think that belonging means that other people want you to identify with them. Uh, they want you to be part of them. Not only is that comfortable for them, but it also makes them feel that they are part of the group. Anything where people do not end up feeling that they can participate in a group, more or less, or you know, they don't have to do everything the group does, but they feel that they are part of the group. Anything that is like that makes people feel that they do belong and that they have a ticket, in a way, to the belonging that everybody else has. And our society does emphasize that what we can do, and that's why we can belong to each other, what we can do uh, is, is, important, is more important than what we can't do. That a society that says what you can do, let's, let's, let's make that important. And that creates a lateral trust among all equals, because we are all equals as human beings. And it's a key element of our democracy. I uh, read a lot of Hannah Arendt when I was uh, a student and, of course, believed that what she wrote about uh, evil, about the Eichmann trial, um, about totalitarianism was really seminal to our work uh, in the 20th century and now following in the 21st. And she says that belonging to each other means that you can hold your ground, that you hold your ground, and that belonging means that you can also have disagreement. And that's the greatest aspect of belonging in a society. When you belong, it allows you to dis disagree with the society, and it allows you, more important, to disagree with its leaders. And that's something that we have to always encourage as we integrate newcomers into our society. We must still encourage newcomers to be themselves as well as to adjust to society's norms. That is to be themselves in the fullest sense of the word. Now in your report, um, Roseanne, you didn't mention the fact, and I was very struck by it, that immigrants who have been here for 10 to 20 years feel that they don't belong. And I ask myself, why? Why after 10 to 20 years do immigrants not feel that they want to belong? Why did they feel that they might have belonged before? Was it the excitement of being welcomed, of, be, of the new? Was it the excitement of seeing their kids go to school and get their first jobs and do it? And then after that, something drops? I think we have to address that. Why does that apathy towards belonging set in at that particular place? Well, one of the reasons why I decided at the end of my mandate as Governor General that I wanted to start a foundation called the Institute for Canadian Citizenship was that I felt nobody did anything for people at the moment where they decided to become Canadian citizens. We're very good at welcoming people, welcoming refugees, um, introducing people to, new, to their new languages, settlement, all of that we were doing, but nobody was doing anything in the non-governmental area for the new citizen. And I felt that that was the moment when you could really make the effort to say to people, you can belong. And so I thought we have to do really practical things to do that. We have to do really practical things like, in public schools they take children by, in the little yellow buses to the museums, to the parks, uh, various things where the children get a chance to see the Royal Ontario Museum. It's in Toronto, the Ontario Science Center. They go to all these places. There are programs. So then I thought, what about their parents working in on assembly lines or in offices? They never get to go. And so one of the first programs we started was called the Cultural Access Pass. And the Cultural Access Pass is saying, you belong. You've paid taxes all the time you've been waiting to become a citizen because you've had jobs, and these taxes have gone to support these institutions like the museums, and you have uh, access to them. So we started a program which now there's 1,500 uh, cultural 
um, places in Canada that are part of the pass for one year, new Canadian citizen, um, from the day he, becomes a, he or she becomes a citizen, can take their ch family of up to four children for free to any of the 1,500 cultural institutions, including you know, the Drumheller uh, Museum of Dinosaurs or uh, Pointe Calier in Montreal, and here in your area, Homer Watson House, the Waterloo Region Museum, the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, the museum, uh, Mackenzie King's ch uh, Childhood House, Woodside, uh, the Canadian Clay and, and Glass Gallery. All of these things, new Canadians can go to for free with their families. And nearby in your area, uh, the Guelph Civic Museum, the Cambridge Galleries, the McDonald Stewart Art Centre. And all of this because I feel that this is what helps people to belong, that they see the history of our country, that they see what's been done in the country, that they know, they go to the historic sites. I also thought that it was very important that they be acquainted with nature because many people come from this country, uh, come to this country who are not acquainted with nature and who fear nature and do not like places with, without sidewalks. And the reason they don't is that it's not particularly valued there. It is valued surprisingly in a lot of places where we don't understand how it's valued. A lot of people who've come from East Africa, for instance, uh, know nature. Um, an Ismaili friend of mine told me, we always, in our little town in Tanzania, my father always said, never go down to that valley when the animals are coming to drink because you'll frighten them away. They have to have their space and their time. So it may be a different kind of nature they were used to, but most people, a lot of people have, can get access to it through memory. And so we now have access to public, the CAP Pass cover, covers access to public parks in Canada, all the national ones and the number of the provincial ones, and you can get in for free, again, uh, with your family for one year, with four, up to four children, and you can use your cultural access pass to go on the via rail trains with half price on the lowest fare advertised. All of this to help people feel, this is yours, you belong. You have to feel ownership in order to belong. You have to feel the real feeling that this is, this is part of what I am. You have to feel that when you're in a park, uh, and there's people scattering um, pieces of paper over it, that you want to pick up that paper because you don't want people to have to see that, that you want to help clean it up, that you want to feel it as part of yours. The other thing that we do is have special ceremonies for citizenship where we emphasize meeting um, what we call established Canadians to uh, avoid the word of old Canadians. And um, we have special ceremonies which are run by volunteer groups across the country. And we have about 40 uh, volunteer groups across the country. We're boosting that to 150 for the sesquicentennial year. And what we do is for an hour before the ceremony, uh, they come and sit at round tables and exchange ideas about what they think about Canada, what, what they hope for their future, what they found discouraging, how they, how they see themselves. Then they go in and have the ceremony, and then afterwards um, we usually eat Timbits and have coffee and have a big cake with a red flag on it. It's all very simple, it doesn't cost that much, and it's been a tremendous success. And our hope had been that by doing this in a seed way, that all of the ceremonies could be done in this way. We do about 2,900 ceremonies in this country through, that's how many we do uh, because of the number of new citizens we get every year, but it's going to be impossible, so we just have to boost the ones that we do ourselves. And we have a local volunteer committee which is co currently forming here in Kitchener-Waterloo, and we've had one in Guelph for a long time, and we're determined that we're gonna have a committee here by autumn. And this idea of your belonging and your being able to take part, we want to start right away with people. We also are able to be in contact with the people that we put through the cultural access pass because they have to get the pass through sending in sending it in uh, by email, so that we are in touch with about 300,000 new Canadians as alumni. And so we were able to do a survey of them before the last election called Ballots and Belonging and tell them about how to vote and how things were happening in the, in the, in the, uh, in the atmosphere around them. And of course that is all kind of subliminal education for the civic duties which, <coughs> which they can have. And I think that belonging is one of those things that happens if you make everything open to people.
If people think that things are closed to them or that they don't have a place in it, they will desist and they will feel that they aren't worth anything. I noticed also in your report that the self, that belonging was not felt by a lot of single parents. And this idea of sense of community was somehow missing from them. And I think that is something that you have to really address because the loneliness and isolation of a single parent family is something that is all our responsibility. And the more those statistics climb, the more it is our responsibility. And when I have a, have a moment, and I usually try to do a couple of times a month, because I, my daughter is a doctor in the east end of Toronto, so I like to take the subway down to Union, and then the Queen's, uh, or to Queen Street, and then I take the Queen Street car, which you may not know is one of the longest streetcar lines in the world, um, and I take it east and see the people getting on and off it and their rapport. And I do it not at rush hour because that's beyond me now. But I really, I like to count the people in it and see what they're like. And the last time I was on, which was last Wednesday, there were 19 people. And I would say that only four of them were part of what I call the Canada that I grew up in. Um, the Canada that was not visibly different to anybody from anybody else because they were mostly white or whitish. And the 15 other people were indeterminately different in all sorts of ways which I couldn't even begin to tell you about. And I thought, really, you know, our idea of belonging and of having people as citizens is such an act of the imagination. We don't start with the idea of a political status quo um, which an idea of a citizen talk, denotes. But we have an idea of citizens, of what they are, how they are, how they relate to each other, how they belong together, from which a nation evolves. And that is how Canada has evolved. And it exists in our imagination. It exists in our imagination. And if it doesn't exist in our imagination, then it doesn't become a reality and it can't exist. Really, civic responsibilities that we take on are part of our imagining that we are part of, the, of, of something, even when we are in dissent. And as I said earlier, it is very important in belonging to know that in order to belong, you don't have to agree with everything. And you don't have to agree with each other and you don't have to agree with your leaders. And I'm always very happy when I see people coming out to fight an ugly development, or a building that's two stories too high, or when they're protesting drunk driving, whatever it is. There is a belonging that is linked to sharing, and in that, we have a concept, I think, which comes to us almost from the indigenous peoples who have the, con the idea of the great bowl, which we all shared. I think that this is not any kind of obligation that we feel, but we feel it instinctively as human beings. And Margaret Lawrence said something years ago, which I always quote in, th in thinking about belonging, which is that really, in your heart's core, you should be able to feel the reality of others. It is the acknowledgement and the reality of others which makes you truly human. Otherwise, you would exist only in isolation. Otherwise, you really are not free to act. You are simply this little cell that has no relationship to anything else. And you cannot live like that. You can't live a human life. Thoughts and action have to be coordinated with others in order to reach a goal in order to create something. And it's in smaller groups, even one or two people, that we believe and we can look in the same direction and actually define what we want in terms of mutual goals. Carl Jung says that first we have to belong to ourselves, that by the middle of life, which I suppose in his time, which was only about 80, 100 years ago, would have been uh, 30, 35 or so, um, we have to become the person that we were meant to be. 
And we all know that there, there is a stage at which we feel as human beings that we have fully started to realize ourselves. And if something blocks us, if something is getting in the way, if something is making that impossible, we become very frustrated and we know that that's not right. In terms of our society, I think we have to realize that when we live together and we take a common goal, which is our citizenship in Canada, that that is a, pl a place and a being that we cannot shift. That no matter when you came here, you accept the country as it is. The country is our country. The country has been created in its own way. Each person has adapted to it in their own way. And we're very fortunate in a country where people have had to make adaptations. When you go to countries where they don't have to make adaptations and where they've been the Gauls for 2,000 years or the Tedeschi in Germany for you know, 2,000 years, you realize that they don't feel that they have to make any adjustments among themselves. They don't jostle with each other that way. And we have jostled and we have come up with something new and different. However, our history is our history. And so when you come here and you become a citizen, you have to say, you know, everything that's happened in this country up till now, I accept and I am part of it now. And I don't, you know, I don't doubt that I can be part of this. And citizenship, as I am really fond of saying, is not a buff all you can eat buffet with choices. It is a prefix menu. And you don't have the choice. This, today there's pea soup, and there's roast chicken, and there's apple pie. And tomorrow, something different. But you take it, and it's, you can't go buy it and say it's a buffet with, I'll take the salmon, but I won't take the shrimp, and I'll take the salad, but I won't take the roasted uh, eggplants. That is not the way it is for citizenship. You have to be, accept the whole thing. And so you have to accept the ugliness of our history, as well as the brilliance of our recent past, and I hope our future, because we did terrible things. I've already mentioned the, the Japanese Canadians, uh, the Chinese head tax, about our indigenous peoples are the thing that lie over us and must be something that we resolve. We cannot say to ourselves, that was done by other people, that was done in a time when you know, we didn't know any better or whatever. As, um, as Governor General, I had the privilege of reenacting treaty ceremonies across this country. One of them that most struck me was in, I did it at Lower Fort Garry in uh, Manitoba, and I was Governor Simpson, happened to be a man, but never mind, and, um, and with, the, with the chief. And I read this treaty, and it, the, reading the treaty was really stunning to me because it said, we are making this treaty nation to nation, and this shall be as good as long, this will last as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the river flows. And that is something we promised, and we have gone back on, and we keep going back on it. And people say, we, you know, we, there's, what can we do, it's so big, etc. I do have hopes that now, in all sorts of directions, we will be solving this. And we saw that other people also understood it, that it didn't have to be indigenous peoples to understand the Idle No More movement. That many people realized that that was something they had to get behind because it was stating something that was really important for us. That, those, that the indigenous people feel that they didn't belong and when it's their country originally and they helped us to discover it and they helped us to be in it and they helped us to be rich in it, this you know, this is really remarkable. Of course, you are in an area which is an, a bit of an anomaly because it was very rich land given uh, because of the actions of Joseph Brandt and the Six Nations during the American Revolution. So this is, a, in a kind of way, an anomaly of a place. But still, we have to remember that in most of Canada and in British Columbia, where there are no treaties except the Nishka, which was done after 40 years of two men's lives negotiating that treaty, which should never have had to take that amount of time. 
that when you talk about unceded land, it means that you are on land that has never had been covered by a treaty. There are places all over the country that are unceded that we feel that we have the right as the settlers to do anything we want with. And we can't have that feeling. It's wrong. We have to be, face that. We have to understand that we can't just talk about belonging uh, for the people like us who have come, who have gotten educated with everything that we've built for ourselves, with our own intelligence, etc. We have to, first of all, understand that we built on top of what was here already. And I think that that leads us into something which is really, really important. This concept that you are a person because of other people. It's something I dealt with in the Massey Lectures, and it's called Ubuntu, and it's an African concept. You cannot be a person with other, without other people. That is a wonderful concept, and one that I think we should all be thinking about all of the time. I'm worrying about you here in Kitchener-Waterloo because your children, apparently, are less likely to be ready to learn um, because of problems with, from, now the grammar a little struck me a little oddly here. I hope I've got it the right way around. Uh, physical health and well-being, their social competence and communication and general knowledge were not up to what you thought they should be in order to deal with what they're faced with going to school when they're in kindergarten. That's horrible. Fix that. <laughs> Why? Why is their physical health and well-being in a country like Canada? What, they're not getting enough milk? I mean, they're not getting fed? I mean, there's, I was involved in a most, a really rearguard action in Toronto where the city council wanted to cut a couple of million dollars out of the budget for school breakfasts. And that's the only meal, whether or not you like breakfast, I happen to hate it myself. It is, this was, in the case of a lot of these downtown children, the only decent meal they got. And they were going to cut this from the city budget when we have a, a budget of billions. We're going to cut this money out. And I just, you know, I think when people do things like that, you just wonder where their heads are screwed on. What are you talking about? These are little children. Little children in our, in our city, we have three to 4,000 little children in Toronto living in shelters. If that isn't a disgrace, I don't know what is. And if you have problems like that, you know, things like physical health and well-being, social competence, the ability to relate to people, and communication and general knowledge means isolation, means not being with other people, means not, not getting that kind of help. You as a community have to address that. You know, you really have to address that. That is, that is a, a very shocking kind of thing. And I think you can. I mean, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. There's, I'm sure, very basic programs that you can put into play that will help with that. The other pro worrying thing I find in your report is that from the um, visible minorities who are 15 to 24 years old are more likely to be unemployed. When people can't have jobs, they don't feel worthwhile. You know, it, it, having a job is not just to earn money. Having a, a job is to validate yourself as somebody who has a brain and, and arms and legs and can do things, whatever your capacity might be. And to be unemployed, you know, to be unemployed from 15 to 24 is very, very, very upsetting. And it's, it's not you alone, believe me, in Quebec, this is a, a big preoccupation for them because they have more school leavings uh, before the age of 16 of young men than in any other province. And I do think that all of these things are tied together. This concern for, for children going, going from kindergarten uh, into school, this, this visible minority, young people, uh, the volunteering, as Roseanne said, being 11% less uh, than, than six years ago. Very frightening. And you know, I want to compare it to Vancouver, whose um, report I just read as well, where their volunteering has grown in the same time, just to make you jealous. <laughs> and what you have going for you are marvelous institutions. Look at this place with its, with its universities. 
uh, with all the cultural richness. Uh, the, uh, yes, your, your, your base has changed in terms of, of the, the kind of industries you had and so on, but you've brought in the knowledge, knowledge factor, you've got still the agriculture, you've got really, you're, you're close to all markets in North America. I mean, all of that is very, very important to think about and to be worrying about and to do something about. You know, Tolstoy said that all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. And I, I um, apply that really to the idea of what community is because I think that what community gives us is a larger family. The idea of a family is sometimes considered to be cozy and a great ideal um, but as Don DeLillo, a great writer whom I very much respect, has a wonderful take on family. He always says that the family is the cradle of the world's misinformation. And that by unity and identification, and this can go with any groups, but families are where it begins, you can cultivate distrust, disdain, and misanthropy. It's very interesting to think that the smaller the group is, and certainly if it's a small blood group, it, you can see how that can happen very well. The opening up of yourself to others, uh, to a family relationship where you include other people, where you look at the other as totally necessary for your functioning as a human being. And you know, Margaret Thatcher is very famous for having said, there is no such thing as society, i.e. there are only individuals. Very unattractive personality. And I met her, so I can say it in all, in all honesty. Um, and I think that we really understand that, you know, it's not about families or about being cozy or about liking people. That's not really what we're talking about. That doesn't enrich community. Private life is wonderful. Loving, pe your, you know, loving the person you live with is marvelous. Loving your little children is marvelous, your grandchildren is, but it's very safe. It's usually without risk. It's usually without having to make any changes to yourself. And we have to learn to live in a society of belonging with the levels of dif discomfort that difference brings. Living with those levels of discomfort shows a sophistication of human activity which differentiates us from what the, the bad side of what we call tribalism. And so we have to understand that we have already created in this country a really remarkable thing because we have always been the country that volunteers the most. We have been the country that, you know, usually around 20 to 25 percent of the population is volunteering on, on a whole. And they tell that to Europeans and they can't believe it. There was a heat wave in France in, um, in about five years ago in which 15,000 old people died. That's because old people generally live in the tops of those six-story buildings that are so glamorous in French movies. Uh, you see, you know, you see uh, Vanessa Paradis running up the stairs of them. And um, nobody thought to go up to the top floors when that heat wave was happening. They don't have air conditioning um, in the cities like that. Nobody thought to go up and ask the old people, do you need anything? Would you like to come downstairs? Um, would, could we help you, etc." 15,000 people died. It was a real recognition for the French that there was something wrong, even though they're, they are very cross and clever. They really did not react well to that fact. They realized that there was something wrong. I do have to compare it to the fact that we had the ice storm in Toronto two Christmases ago and there were a million people involved with the ice storm, and that absolutely no one died. And it was minus 10, minus 15, et cetera, and there were, because everybody went out and asked their neighbors and went up into the apartment buildings and said, could we help, et cetera. We did that, we did that instinctively because we do understand the other. And then that's why immigrants don't remain immigrants. They become us just as we become you. And it is very important for us that we continue to do that. 
I think that we have a society that is like a kind of great friendship. And by that, I don't mean anything mushy. Because our society is based on a different kind of, of tensions, a different kind of, of, of reality and ac acceptances, a different kind of ability to look at other people and say they're different, so what? Um, we have that ability and we don't have, we don't generally feel we have to make anyone conform to anything. And there's a wonderful definition of friendship which I really, really like and which really explained to me when I first read it years ago why I was friends with certain people and not with others. Michael Oakeshott, who's not noted for friendship particularly but just happened to turn up in an essay, um, Friends are not concerned with what may be made of one another, but only with the enjoyment of one another. And the condition of this enjoyment is a ready acceptance of what is and the absence of any desire to change or improve. A friend is not somebody one trusts to behave in a certain manner, who supplies certain wants that you have, who has certain useful abilities, who possesses certain merely agreeable qualities or who holds certain acceptable opinions. He is somebody who engages your imagination, who excites your contemplation, who provokes interest, sympathy, delight, and loyalty simply on account of who they are and the relationship you have entered into. It's one of the best definitions I've ever read because it accounts for the fact that friends can be people who are not alike. And that's, if we have a society of people who are friends, and I think we do in Canada, it is because we give them the spaces to be what they are, and we have our spaces. I have friends who are not like me at all, who have not traveled the same kind of path, who have not had the same kind of opportunities, who have had other opportunities, who have done other things. And I never ask myself, why is it that I'm a friend? I just like them. And when you just like them, you know that all of these things are full. You're not getting anything from them. You don't want anything from them. And I think really, it always, I had a definition for friendship, and when I finally found this by Michael Oakeshott, I thought it fits. Mine was shorter, and I'm not a philosopher. And that is, when you're with a friend, you know that you are the person you want to be. They make you feel that you're, you're a good person, or you are nice. And when you're with people that you don't like, you hate yourself. Uh, when you're people with, that do, with you, whom you will not be friends, you don't want to, you don't want to be with yourself. When you're with the person who is a friend, you like yourself better. And I think that's the kind of society that we want to create. That's the kind of thing that really makes true belonging. And also, one friend can't replace another. You know, one, it's a personality that direct. And I think that idea of our belonging to each other is that. A, the relationship of a friend to a friend is not utilitarian, but it's rather dramatic. And Margaret Thatcher, who said that there was no such thing as society, is quite simply wrong. The reason why we have a society is not so that everybody loves each other, and I go back to my ideas about the family and the coziness there. It's not that everybody loves each other, that's not the point. It's that we give space to each other, and we also realize that other people whom we don't like and who do we don't want to stand in the same bus shelter with and he would never go and eat lunch with have every right to live in this country and have every right to everything that's offered in this country even if you don't like them and will never like them. Society is made up of that. It is not made up of the kind of people that will make your club or your bridge group or the people that you will go on a cruise with. It is made up of all kinds of people, and they're not the people, necessarily, that you would want your daughter to marry. <laughs> and if they do, you have to cope with that. <laughs> but the reason why you have to cope with it is because they may dislike you, 
just as much as you like them. It's very hard for us to ever say, gosh, somebody really dislikes me. But when you come to that point, you know you've reached a certain level of maturity. And, and you have to accept that. And I think it's very important for children to learn, too, that they're not going to like everybody and that everybody won't like them. And that that does not mean that they are not a worthwhile person. That does not mean they will not contribute. And that does not mean that the other person is not a worthwhile person and will not contrib contribute. You don't know that. And that's the big unknown in human relationships. And in a society like ours, which is completely free, we have to be, sh be, be sure that that's the way in which we behave. We all came to this country, and our ancestors did, um, two, three generations back, out of very diverse traumas. Because an immigrant country is one in which people were rejected, thrown on boats, uh, told they couldn't go somewhere where they really wanted to go, and had to come here with the one thing that our groups, when we ask them in our ceremonies, what don't you like about Canada? The weather. <laughs> and that's why I'm very amused to read in the Toronto Star that they, they sent a reporter to a refugee camp in, Syria, in uh, Jordan and talked to some people who were Syrian refugees. And they said, we don't really want to go to Canada. It's so cold. So the headline was, Refu Syrian refugees don't want to go to Canada. I think if you were offered the choice between Canada and Virginia, you would probably not choose Canada, because you could go to a place where there wasn't snow to be shoveled, where you didn't have to have four wardrobes for the year, and all of that. But the weather has brought us the kind of country we are. We all know that at some moment, we, it might be 40 minus 30 out, we'd have to knock on someone's door, and they would have to take you in. They have to take you in. And we see that every time there's a huge snowstorm or anything, and cars are lined up on the highways, and people can't get out, and they're stuck for a day or two. Some farmer goes out from his farm, trudge, 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 and gets all the people that he can get to come to his farmhouse and spend the night. You know, he makes trouble to do that. And that is because we are inbuilt, I believe, to really help each other. I think it goes back to our evolution as human beings when we were evolving as hum Homo sapiens and we defeated the Neanderthal that way. I have, my godson is an actor in London and he's got a role as the last Neanderthal. I have to put a role in, in a series that will appear on Netflix apparently. <laughs> and, um, and so we were talking about this recently on the phone. And he said, you know, they think I look like a Neanderthal. Well, actually, he's a great character actor. So I said, don't worry about that. You know, you don't want to look like Tom Cruise in any case. And, <laughs> and the thing is that I think we were trying to save ourselves. I do believe that these things, these neur neurons, are in us, that we wanted to save every bit of our human race that we could. And that wars like the First World War, which are un execrable and hideous with the loss of life are really show what society does to people after, you know, has done to people with competition and with all the knowledge of it. But when we were really evolving as people, we had to save people. And in, and in moments of hideous crisis, we save people. And I had the, the, and I will end with this because I think it is one of the greatest examples of what we are as a group or a community. As Governor General, I was privileged to give out the Bravery Awards two times a year. So 30 people would come two times a year to Rideau Hall to get medals or stars for bravery. And naively, I believed when they first came, and now I was doing the first, before the first ceremony, I always believed, and when I read about it in the paper before, I used to believe that people saved their own families, you know, from fires or from drowning or from whatever, and that they had some interest in the person, and therefore were saving them. It was their wife, it was their baby, it was their grandchild. No, <laughs> I would say in 99% of the time, of six years of all those ceremonies, very, I would say there were maybe four histories of people who'd saved their, in their families. They were saving total strangers at complete risk to themselves, and they were people who you know, should not have been doing that. Why would they do that? They had families of their own. Why were they doing that? The most extreme examples were somebody driving down the road by the Fraser River in April 
and seeing a woman attempt to commit suicide by jumping off the bridge and jumping in the water fully clothed and saving her. The instinct to save that person who was paying, you know, who actually wanted to end their own life was the, was the effort of what belonging really means, which is that you are part of me. You are part of me. I want you to be saved. The other one is more common and very common. You know, 12 people were standing in a row before me to get their medals, and I assumed they were members of a volunteer fire department. They were from the prairies, it figured, and they were all from little towns, and I thought they were all different little towns. But no, they didn't know each other at all. They'd all been having coffee at a local coffee shop on the main highway, and they heard that a tanker, uh, a truck tanker, was, had rolled over and was starting to burn. So they all rushed out, and they managed to rescue the driver, and uh, at great risk of life because it was starting to flame up and was all flammable. And it was so flammable that when they got the man out and they all rushed to the verge and threw themselves in the grass, etc., the truck blew up and the macadam was destroyed so the highway was closed for a day. Uh, they were all strangers to each other. They didn't have a they were not doing a paid job. They were not doing anything that they were, two of them were members of a volunteer fire department in their own towns. They were not doing that. And the third example is a, a man in Kingston who was following somebody on the highway on 401, saw the car start to go up in flames in front of him, swerved to the shoulder. He goes over to the shoulder. He leaps over to the car. He breaks the car, the, uh, the roof with, a, with his hands, with jumping on it, said luckily it was partly open, and drags the man out, and then the car blows up. So I said, what made you do that? Why did you do that? I mean, you have a wife, you have a family. They all had come with him. And he said, I looked down at, when, when the car, well, flames were starting, and I looked down into his face, and I thought, that guy is me. That total identification that you are part of humanity, that you yourself are the person that is to be saved, that there is no barrier between you, that that humanity of being that human being that human being who is just like the other human being, who is no less and no more than any other human being, is what can carry us through and make our lives worthy. Megwich. Merci. Thank you. Good evening. Madame Clarkson uh, has graciously offered to do a short Q&A. So if, if there is a question that you would like to ask, I believe we have a one traveling mic. Oh, they're everywhere. So <laughs> if you could just raise your hand if there is a question. Oh, right up there. In and out two doors. Thank you very much for giving us so much to think about and to really energize our community. I don't really have a question. I just want to say thank you for the call to action, particularly around our children in this community. My name is Dorothy Snyder, and I, am, uh, I work in the field of family support, working with parents to strengthen parenting capacity, working with families to strengthen the capacity of children to learn. The questions you asked are questions we ask ourselves all the time. We have a wonderful community that works together to really strengthen and work with families, with the assets they have to build the well-being of all families. And yet, 
we still have that in our vital signs report. So the question we do ask ourselves is why? What do we have to do and what will we do? So I thank you for that call for action because if our children aren't in a good place for their physical, emotional, social well-being, the families aren't, our community isn't, and our future certainly isn't very healthy. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Is that it? Oh, there you are. Just shout out, I think. Oh, yes. Your talk was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great to hear from a younger generation perspective and uh, some insights as well. You spoke a lot about the public sector and nonprofit, kind of some of the stuff that has been done, but what do you think private sector um, organizations and companies can do to help with people feeling like they belong in the community? Well, I think they can give money to the nonprofit sector. And, and give a lot of it. The, it what, what is worrying me enormously, and I think a lot of people, is the increasing income disparity in Canada. I often, I often, I have said, I said it in my autobiography, um, we, we never felt poor. I mean, we didn't have anything, but we weren't poor. And, um, and we got gradually earned, you know, my father got a better and better job and stuff, and, and had then started his own business, so we then did quite well by the time I was able to go to university. But we didn't have a car till I was 12. It shows the generation I come from, I suppose. But I didn't think anything of that because neither did anybody else. I remember when a friend of mine, Lucy, her parents got a car and we drove and they, she asked if I could drive out with them and my mother was very worried and she said, you know, does Bob drive well? I mean, how do we know when you go in his car, etc. Anyway, we did go for a drive and I remember that very well. I was, must have been 10. He was, she was the first person I knew whose family had a car. So we grew, you know, a lot of people here, I know by looking at you, grew up at the same time when we didn't have all of that, where shopping was not, uh, a kind of you know distraction and um, what you did as a hobby, and uh, <laughs> and when people did you know think very much about how they were going to save for this or that and earn this or that, and and I think I'm not going to go back and be a boring old fart about that, but I think really um, uh, private enterprise has its role to play as they are making enormous profits and they know it. Okay, you can press that button. They know they're making enormous profits. And they know that they're suffering around them. And I would say, you know, just go and lean on them as much as possible. And that's what private people, because they, they don't have, if you're in the private world, and there's nothing wrong with it, it is one of those facts of life, you are in it to make a profit. And if you have large profits, then you can afford to give some away, particularly if you are a client-based company. I'll name no names. And if you have a client-based company and you are appealing to that client base, it is very much in your interest to help. And I think a number of them do, but they've got to do more. I think, you know, programs for children's health, uh, all of that, that sort of thing, though, that it has to be well-planned on the part of the nonprofit sector. It has to be something where you have goals as to, you know, trying to end a certain amount of that poverty by a certain date, et cetera. I think you have to have real goals. It can't be just a, a continual funding stream. I think there has to be work on both sides in that. Um, uh, forgive me for not standing. Uh, I have my, my, my interest, I'm an old man, as you can see. I, uh, I couldn't see that from here. Oh, OK. <laughs> I thank you for that. I, I wonder, how, how can we, as a society in Canada, help to make the, the uh, young Muslim men, for example, not leave the country and join ISIS. How do we, is that a problem that we can solve at all? I don't think that many leave. I mean, I think it's, it, I'm certain that there are some who do, but Muslim, uh, Islam is just as, as diverse as Christianity, as, uh, as Judaism is. There are all kinds of branches of it. There are all kinds of, of methods of practice of it, 
and um, I don't think that one can say that they are particularly prone uh, to uh, becoming terrorists uh, because they are Muslim. I think what we have to worry about is any people feeling that they are excluded from society or that they are best, the better off getting back at the society that, that actually produced them. Um, we have to say, we have to worry about that. I don't think you're going to do it by instigating program, you know, uh, watches on how people learn in mosques or whatever. Some branches of Islam don't have mosques. The Ismailis have a Jamat Khana, which is, which is a meeting, community meeting place. They worship in a, in a different way, although they have the prayers every day exactly uh, like other Muslims. But there are just, it's, it's just as huge a gamut as in Christianity, from, you know, from one end to Roman Catholicism to um, Pentecostal. That's exactly what they have in Islam. And what I really think is necessary is that there is so much ignorance about Islam that we can be told almost anything about it and people will sort of believe it. And it'll be true about at maybe 3% of them or 5% of them, so that's enough for us to be convinced. But we have absolutely no knowledge of it. I mean, how many people here have read the Quran? I saw one person, two people, three, four. But, you know, when I quote the Quran, which I didn't tonight to you, but I do often, um, the Quran is, is very interesting and, and different. It's 600 years, the religion is 600 years younger than Christianity, okay? So they are, they are in a different phase of the way they deal with questions of faith and all of that. And in the Quran, it's, it's, we're told um, that the Creator created us all as a single project. All humanity is a single project. And because we were created by the Creator, we are part of that whole, which is a single thing. And that He could have made us all the same, but He did not, because it was a challenge to us to get on with each other. And that is not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. That's a really interesting point that I find so wonderful in the Quran. Um, and I think we don't know, we don't bother to read it, we don't bother to know anything except you know, things that are not, e not even digested by the press. So I don't think I would start out by worrying about people being uh, made radical in, in that way of becoming terrorists. In, in mosques or worrying about what the madrasas are teaching here. I think what we need to know is how we can make people feel that they belong so that they buy into our way of life, even while keeping their religion and their memories of what they had before they came here and what they were. Um, my husband and I went to meet the first load of government-sponsored refugees at the end of December, and we, we really, it was a wonderful occasion, and I was very proud of how we welcomed them and, and did everything at the airport. But, and we talked to people through interpreters, and the people that we were most worried about were the 14 to 18 year old boys. Because they have not been, none of those children have been in school, including the little ones, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, for, for three and a half years. They've been in refugee camps for three and a half years. They have to cover that gap uh, and the teenage boys were the ones we came away really worried about. They have to feel that they belong. They have to be, they have to be, there has to be special programs for, for, for people who are that age to use up all that testosterone, uh, to make them feel that they can learn the language and be part of things at a time it's very difficult for any adolescent boy, much less one who has been uprooted lived in a camp where there are, you know, all sorts of awful things that happen to them, even in, in the best camps, and I don't think there are really best camps that are mostly horrible. Um, and I think that all we can do is make our society as healthy as possible and to be as welcoming as possible. You know, there should be no exclusion. Hi. Madam Clarkson, in your speech, you mentioned about citizenship. I believe that as citizens, 
Canadian citizens, and I'm proud to say I'm a 25-year-old Canadian. When I came to this country, I felt I belonged because I wanted to belong. Mm -hmm. In your speech, you mentioned citizenship, and I don't know whether I heard or I, I wanted to hear education in citizenship. We all ask ourselves, are we raising purposeful citizens? Are we graduating purposeful citizens? And are we open to teach purposeful citizens to the newcomers? You had started, you, you worked with citizens. Is there a chance that you can globalize it all over Canada and maybe the world? Because eventually, it starts with us, our families, communities, countries, and the world. And that's how we can make the world a better place. I think, I think we can because we have an example here in Canada, something we've done, and we're so self-congratulatory about it because it has worked, but we don't ha have an idea. We don't have, you know, what the hell have we done? We don't really know. We don't know how we've done it. And that's why it's very dangerous. It's like sitting on a really well-decorated little powder keg because we don't know how we've done it. We have been successful. We have, you know, we have, we, you go to schools in, in any downtown area, you see these kids, you don't know what country in the world you could be in. It couldn't be any particular country except Canada because of the mixture. You know, you don't find that mixture in Africa or in Europe or anything. And so we don't know how we've done it. And this is why the Institute actually is doing a, a, a thing called Six Degrees in the fall for three days. And we are, we are going to have um, three half-day uh, discussions bringing people from all over the world. We want, to make to, we want to make Canada the Davos of citizenship, that every year people will have to come to Canada to exchange ideas about citizenship. And we're only saying, we're, ba you know, we're basing it here because we have done it. We don't know how long we can continue to do it. We're open to this, and we want to have your ideas as well. And there are people who are wanting to do it and are trying to do it in Germany and in Holland, despite all the horrors that you hear about and the rise of the right wing and so on, there are people who are really trying to do it. And you know, the fact that London has just elected a Muslim mayor is a very interesting thing because A, it means that there is the population that believes they should have a Muslim as their mayor, and they have a Muslim who is a working class person, which in, in Britain, which is still the class-ridden country, that you know you wouldn't want to, I mean I wouldn't want to live there it's so class ridden imagine their whole cabinet went to Eton there's a little tiny school you know in the Windsor Park I, it's crazy and um, you know how you know how on earth could you believe those people knew, know anything <laughs> I think you know our our way of, of you know it's 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 a kind of democracy which they've gotten used to because they vote for people okay but it's not the kind of democracy that we feel that we should be having in, in an evolved country. So anyway, this six degrees, we hope we're going to have one session which is called inclusion, and we're going to have all kinds of people who were excluded plus included, and we're going to have another session called Europe, which is about Europe facing its dilemma of people being able just to run over borders or, or try to take boats to them at whatever risk to themselves. And the third one is called prosperity, because it can be shown and is shown, really, that immigration enriches Canada and that immigrants create businesses, do things, you may come, become part of something that makes us richer, that it is an investment for our country, that it is not a drain. There may, you know, you have to take a long spreadsheet to look at it. Initially, you give them things and do things and all sorts of things, but then it evens out and then it starts planing up and you look at every group that's ever come here and see what they have done when they've had the opportunity to, and we have been enormously enriched by our, our immigration. And it's always been that way. People have always come here because there's opportunity. I mean, the Hudson's Bay boys that were in the Orkneys, that, the, that the, were brought out by Hudson's Bay to be the factors of Hudson's Bay to then do things, they were penniless you know, illiterate kids who came to Canada and they created the wealth. They started to create that wealth for us. And that's true of all the countries that we've come from because the opportunities are here and nobody really, nobody holds you back because we've gotten rid of all of that stuff. And it's as though we went through a phase where we had to go through ugly stuff in order to get where we are, but we don't have to be back there anymore. 
And I think we now, we know that we want to be the kind of country that we were meant to be. Okay. <laughs> hey there. Um, I consider myself an extremely open-minded person, pretty non-judgmental. Every now and again, things can get a little bit hard. Um, it kind of seems like certain people have sunshine, you know, coming out of them from the time that they wake up to the time that they go to sleep. Tell me it's hard Not for many. you sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Just confirm for me that it's hard for you sometimes. And every now and again, there's some way that you kind of have to tweak your brain and maybe share with me how you, how you do that. Oh, do I have low moments, you mean? Moments where it's hard not to judge, I guess, you know? Life helps you with that, you know. And living long is the best revenge. <laughs> Actually, I think, you know, you just have to plug on. You know, no matter what happens, you just have to persevere. One of the things I didn't talk about tonight, which I'm very fond of talking about, is the Bhutanese idea of gross national happiness, which I talked about in the Massey lectures, which is about generosity, ethics, patience, and perseverance. And I think that, you know, is, is something that you have to learn in your own life to deal with. Um, there are horrible moments, and of course, things, you know, things can go very, very badly. And I must say that, that uh, I think Canada has taken a, a, a good turn at this point. And, um, and uh, I'm not, no longer Governor General, so I can say that. <laughs> and I do believe that people in Canada know in their heart of hearts what we are what we're like and what we are capable of and what we can do. And we, uh, I think that's one of the most important things about us is that we know, we have this knowledge about ourselves and we, we, we reinforce it because we have our organizations. I mean, the very fact of, of something like the foundations that cities have, the Kitchener-Waterloo Foundation, uh, all of them, and that they're linked together, that, that people do things together, that you can pool resources and do better things with other people than you could do on your own. That's just an example. I mean, the foundations of cities, the capital F foundations of cities, prove that we are more than just ourselves. And of course, all of, all of us who have, you know, who have a brain and who aren't insane know that there is really nothing that you can just say, I am going to do it and I will succeed, etc. Even the people who look as though they have done that have had people who help them. And I think you need help right from the very beginning. You have to have mentors, you have to have people who looked, looked at you and said, you know, maybe you could do this or that. You have to reach out for, uh, for advice to people. And I think that, the, and then sometimes it's just luck and circumstance. I always talk, when you ask me about that, I always talk about, first of all, my parents were the greatest influence in my life. And I do believe that they would have done anything for me and my brother. And outside of them, my high school English teacher, Mr. Mann, who was the forever losing his deposit CCF candidate for Ottawa East. <laughs> and he was the most wonderful English teacher when we had our 100th and 120th anniversary at Lisgar Collegiate. We, all we, said, we wrote back and we said, we all want to have another English class taught by Mr. Mann. And this was in about 19... 78, I guess, and Mr. Mann, although he was on dialysis, came into the gym where 800 of us were waiting, and he just sat down and said, today we are going to read two poems together, The Snake by D.H. Lawrence and uh, The Piano, which we had all taken in grade 13. You, some of you here may remember grade 13. And, um, and he then said, you know, Miss Blair, read the poem aloud. She read the poem aloud. And then he said, you know, in the sunlight, in my pajamas, what does that say to you? Anyway, we were just blissed out. Uh, and I was very fortunate in that Mr. Mann saw in me something. I do not know what, but his daughters became something as well. Gretchen Bruin, his daughter, became the speaker of the legislature in British Columbia. 
and Susan Mann was the first female president of York University. And um, he believed that I had a future, and he said to me, you've got to go to University of Toronto, you've got to go to Trinity College, you also have to learn public speaking because you have a, a knack for it, and I will train you for the Rotary Public Speaking Contest. And that's what gave me the confidence to always be able to speak. And he, those were very rigorous contests. I don't know if any of you were ever in them because they were citywide and you competed as high schools. And uh, you had to give a 10 minute prepared talk without notes. And then they distributed strips of paper that had subjects on them and you had to give a three minute impromptu. Like somebody with, you get a thing saying the postage system or um, the, the other one was trees, I remember. Um, and um, uh, it was never anything really hard like Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, what would we have known about Leonardo da Vinci then? But it was, you know, about, so you had to make up, luckily I, I had the postal system once and I just remembered hearing that it wasn't free once. So I riffed on that for three minutes, it was okay. <laughs> and, um, and said how glorious it was that now it was free and that lovers could write to each other. I don't know, I just went on. <laughs> and, um, and Mr. Mann, you know, to this day, I must say that when I was at Rideau Hall, often when I was giving a longer speech, not the short ones, which would be eight or nine minutes, but when I was giving a longer speech, I would look down and I swear to you, I could see Mr. Mann in the back row, nodding. And, and he had a mustache and he'd sort of nod and you could see his mustache twitch twitching. And he would, because always came to all my speeches and I came second. And he took me into the Peacock Alley at the Shadow Laurier because that was where the contest was held. And he said, you did very well. I'm not saying you didn't win because you were a girl, <laughs> but you would have won had you not been a girl. <laughs> so I said that, you know, I guess, I guess that's just unfair. And he said, you know that life is unfair. And I said, yes, I know that life is unfair. He said, well, just do the best you can to deal with that unfairness. And he was such an ethical person. He used literature to teach us all about what life was. And that kind of person, he really carried me through you know, a lot of things. I would think, what would Mr. Mann think about this? Uh, you cannot underestimate how somebody like that can affect a young person forever. And of course, I've always you know, told that to his daughters, and they you know, are happy to think about that. And he was also very supportive, obviously, of them. And, um, and I think you look for mentors, you look for people who are going to help you. And that's what makes me believe so strongly in the public education system, because there was a man who believed that in public education, who looked at all his students as they were and thought of their future. He thought of a lot of people's future. When we went back for our reunions, and I had one for our 150th at Rideau Hall for the whole school. And people talked about Mr. Mann again. And the influence of one single person like that in a public school system is just tremendous. And I think that's what public schools, and I put my little pitch in here, I didn't say it to you but before, but public education is the single most important thing that we have going for us as an immigrant nation. If we don't have strong public education, we can't integrate children and we can't make our values known. That is the most important thing. Any, any erosion of that public system is going to see us heading towards hell and, damn fire and, and damnation. And this morning, Anna Maria Tremonti had um, a, a discussion about charter schools and, and public schools, and they had a very interesting expert whose name I didn't catch on talking about the outcomes of children in private schools and in public schools. And the outcomes are the same. So why? Would you spend $30,000 a year to send your child to a private school um, when your, your property taxes are already helping to send children to school and should? And I do also want to point out that we have never had a prime minister of this country or a governor general of this country, except for Vincent Massey, uh, a Canadian one, who went to a private school. You've also sat through quite a long session here. Um, 
if someone's having a bad day, like one of their worst days of their life, how would you, how can you help them belong? Well, if it's not you having the bad day, okay? I mean, say you're talking about somebody else or is you talking about yourself? Um, somebody else. Okay. With somebody else, I think you have to say to them, you know, whatever is bothering you, it's going to go away. Or if it's not going to go away, you are the person who's going to come out through this in the end as yourself. Okay? You yourself are going to come out of this in your own way. And don't do anything that you would ever regret to try and get over this. Just do the best you can. And you know, sometimes you just have to say, you just have to put up with something. You know, I, I said uh, that somebody said to me that adversity in a childhood was not a bad thing. Sometimes pe bad things happen to you when you're a child. And you can get over it because, you know, you say to yourself, you know, tomorrow will be better than this. Um, you think of all the children in the world who are suffering and have terrible things happen to them. And people in our own country who had that happen. Think of our Aboriginal people who had all those children who had their childhood taken away from them by going to residential schools. All those families that were broken up. They were told they were, their culture was worthless and that they, you know, they were really people who, who were not worth being alive unless they became something else, which they didn't want to be. To become something else, if you want to be something else, is fine. You can become prince, you know. You can become Madonna. You can become all sorts of things if you want to, and it's in your purview. Nobody's going to tell you not to become anything else. But if somebody else makes you be something else, that's when you have to really be worried about that. If you made the choice yourself, you know what the price you've paid. People, all of those people, the ones I've named, who are famous, they've all paid a certain kind of price to be what they are. They know what it is. If they're, if they're sensible and intelligent, they know what that's, what that's been. But you can help them by being their friend and telling them that you value them and that you care about them. No matter what happens, that you will be there for them and that they can always talk to you. I think often people feel that when they're suffering from something, they can't tell anybody about it and think if you can tell somebody about it, it will help. You know, and if your friend, if you could say, can you just talk to me, I'd like to know, and maybe I can, I can just help a little, or I can find you some help. Thank you. Good evening. Madame Clarkson, or as the Blood Tribe has named you, Grandmother of Many Nations, thank you for your insights, your wisdom that you have shared with us here tonight. Thank you for the way you have and continue to serve our country. Thank you for the gift that you have given our children, our grandchildren, and us through your writings and where you have shared much of your wisdom. In Belonging, the Paradox of Citizenship, Madame Clarkson writes, I have made belonging the interest of my life. I was and am a child of diaspora. I am someone who for a while did not belong anywhere. And I will always be someone who understands the everlasting anguish of not belonging. You've touched upon a number of points tonight, both in your talk, but also in your writing that resonate much with our own learning and experience at House of Friendship. And belonging does have to be an act of the imagination. Firstly, I want to bring attention to where you write, belonging in its truest sense means understanding the nature of the connections between one another. The very nature of interconnectedness, it can never mean dominance or submission. 
To define belonging is to understand its laterality. It will always move horizontally, never vertically. This is the lesson that we have learned over 77 years at House of Friendship. There is no us and them. Belonging does not happen through the traditional charitable model of I have, you need. So, how do we build belonging? The second point, and a quote from Madame Clarkson's book, which I hope you've all purchased a copy, by the way. The best way of helping people belong is to walk the path with them as they become part of ordinary life while retaining their own values. While we walk with individuals struggling with addictions, food insecurity, poverty, homelessness, it is in that horizontal relationship when we walk with others that we recognize we are all broken and we share a common humanity. We need each other to belong with the ability to disagree, as Madame Clarkson has so well pointed out. And lastly, my absolute favorite part of your book, and you were smart enough to put it right at the end, so you have to keep reading till that point. We are most fully human, most truly ourselves, most authentically individual, when we commit to the community. It is in the mirror of our community the street, the neighborhood, the town, the country, that we find our best selves. And that is what another lesson that many of you in this room who've made belonging your work's life, your life's work, have learned that getting involved in the work of belonging fundamentally changes us. And so with that, I want to do a call to action similar to Madame Clarkson. Like her, let's make belonging our life's work as we build a community where all can belong and thrive. Let's live with levels of discomfort between each other. It's not about having to like each other. But I call each of us to make it our life's work. And if you do not choose that call of action, may you heed these words from Madame Clarkson's book, where she talks about Pericles. Pericles advised the citizens to acknowledge poverty and said that the real disgrace of poverty was not that it existed, but that citizens would decline to struggle against it and eradicate it. He urged citizens to involve themselves in public matters. Those who took no part in their civic duties, he condemned not merely as unambitious, but as useless. So I leave you with that for ignoring the call to action. Don't be useless. Or in Madame Clarkson's language, fix it. I leave one word of wisdom too that I have learned through Madame Clarkson where she talks about something that her father would often say. He used to say that life wasn't for taking seriously, just for doing seriously. So Madame Clarkson, thank you for coming this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have left um, some gifts for Madame Clarkson uh, in her room. One of them, uh, for those of you who don't know, there's an actual flower named after Madame Clarkson, the white peony. It would have been nice to know that those are not widely available. <clears throat> <laughs> but I got to know a lot of nurseries in our community. <laughs> Apparently you can only get them in Hudson. But I think we got you an appropriate peony called the Bowl of Beauty. One other gift that I would like to bring attention to is, and it captures, I believe, your story and some of the things you talk about, is Yukiko. Are you here, Yukiko? Where are you? 
right here. Yukiko came to our country 17 years ago. And to belong, got involved in our community. And uh, a few years ago, came to Sunnydale Community Center. And I believe part of the English conversation circle. And then you found out about a sewing circle and started sewing a quilt. And uh, we just thought that was great that Yukiko did that. But as we've seen time and time again in the stories you've shared, Yukiko came back with the quilt and donated it back. And she's quite honored to share that gift with you today as a gesture of thanks for coming to our community and being with us. Thank you. And thank you, Yukiko. This wonderful piece of art you will get to see more closely. Uh, we will be having a book signing happening. No, don't just nod, tell me where. <laughs> Out that way? Okay, there will be a book signing to, and you will also be able to look at this incredible um, piece of art that sums up all the wisdom that was shared. So thank you for this wonderful art and being a part of tonight. Lastly, I would like to thank a few folks that made this evening possible. First of all, to Sandra University of Waterloo um, for hosting us here. Kelly McManus, thank you for coming on board and allowing this um, great venue to host Madame Clarkson. To my friend Rosemary Smith at the Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation, thank you for allowing this vision to become a reality. And lastly, to three other folks who actually did all the real hard work and made this evening possible. To Bethan Llewellyn, come on out, Bethan. Um, Alyssa Borland. And, and my colleague, Christine Ryer from House of Friendship. Thank you to each of you for making the time, coming tonight, to being a part of this, for building a community of belonging. I leave you with this as you head your different ways and build the different communities. And I leave you with this quote in honor of Madame Clarkson. I would like to do one more quote from Pericles. What you leave behind is not engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Have a good night. Thank you.